In this video, I'm going to show you a remarkable tactical idea played by Magnus Carlsen in his game at the European Team Championships. He's playing with White against Icelandic Grandmaster Jörfar Stein Greitarsson. And the remarkable thing about this game is that he used the very same tactical idea in an earlier game this year he played. So let's have a look what this tactic is about. So Magnus starts with the move e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, we have the Spanish opening, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, and Magnus wants to avoid theory, so he goes for the line with d3 to protect the pawn. It's a modest move, but it uh, keeps a lot of play in the position. And now after bishop c5, it's the active development of this dark squared bishop, Magnus goes for c3, black goes b5, attacking the bishop on uh, a4, bishop goes to b3, d6, and now Magnus puts the bishop on g5. That's an active way of developing the bishop and it pins the knight on, uh, on f6. And in a separate video, I've already talked about how this pin can become very unpleasant, especially if there is a knight coming to c3 and then to d5. Well, with a pawn on c3, that's not gonna happen, but there are other ways you can pull off uh, a lot of pressure against that uh, knight. So black played here the move h6, asking the bishop what it's gonna do. And now bishop h4. This is the interesting moment because up to this point, we are following a game Magnus played a few months back at the uh, one of the online tournaments against um, top grandmaster from Iran, uh, Amin Tabatabai. And this game I've covered also on the channel. So I'm not gonna reveal what happened in that game. Make sure to check out that video as well and of course you should become a subscriber become a member of the robert wrist chess community i will really appreciate all the support we are going to focus on what happened in the game tabata by play the move bishop to b6 but greaterson deviates here with the move bishop a7 now you may wonder what is the difference between these two moves well it's probably subtle but at least because the bishop is no longer on c5 white can never attack that bishop with gain of time with the move d3 d4 so the bishop is far away and um well we, we will get to see some additional ideas knight bd2 was played black unpins that knight on f6 with the move g5 that's interesting ambitious move and very typical for these structures you're attacking that bishop on uh, h4 the bishop really cannot go anywhere apart from g3 so that move was uh, played in the game and greaterson goes for the move queen to e7. So that's a solid move, trying to get a better grip on the pawn on e5. If white ever tries to open the center with a move d3, d4, then at least that pawn is uh, well defended. But the big question, of course, is what is black now going to do with its king? The king is in the center, but does it really want to castle kingside? If you castle kingside, you've got to reckon with ideas like, um, like h4, for uh, for instance, and there's a pressure, the, the pawn weakness on g5 can be targeted. And there are other weaknesses as well, as we will get to see in the game. So now you would expect white to castle kingside. That's a logical move. But the question is what you're going to do next with your knight from, um, from d2. Well, the typical plan in this Spanish openings is to move the rook to e1 and then knight f1, knight e3 and so on. But Magnus wants to be a very clever player goes for the move knight f1 right away before castling that's also a very well known idea in these structures so the knight is on its way to e3 and try to gain control over both the d5 and the f5 square bishop e6 knight e3 played and here great uh played the move rook to b8 so i think this is some sort of a difference with the between the moves bishop b6 and the move bishop uh, a7 now with a rook on b8 you're trying to discourage uh, white from uh, playing the move a4 at any time because that potentially opens up the b file for the rook and then well the bishop on b3 or even the pawn on b2 may come under an attack so at least white is not going to play the move a4 right now but instead goes for the move castling kingside and well that looks Quite, uh, quite nice. White has uh, ideas to probably go rook e1 and at the right moment prepare the move d3, d4 when there are there are ideas to play d45 attacking both 
knight on c6 and the bishop on uh, e6, but you're also pressurizing the pawn on e5. With this bishop on g3, that piece is out of play, but once you put a pawn on d4, you're trying to increase the pressure against that pawn on uh, e5. I think white's position is somewhat more pleasant, maybe it's playable for black, but Gatorson realizes that there are some issues to be solved here, especially regarding its king's safety. So he decides now to go for the radical move. Bishop takes knight on e3. After f takes e3, that beautiful bishop is no longer there. White has a double pawn on the e-file, but most importantly, the f-file has been opened. Black castled kingside here, but at least black no longer has to reckon with any knight jump coming to f5 or d5. So what is White's plan now? Well, very simple, shifting the attention to the king side. The knight goes away to, uh, to d2, opening up the f file so that the rook can put some pressure over there. Black goes for the move bishop g4, attacking the queen on d1. The queen goes to e1, and now the bishop goes to h5. So the idea is to put a bishop on g6 so that the bishop better guards the, the king at, uh, at that side uh, of, of the board. Knight f3 back was played, so you may think what is exactly the, uh, the idea. Well, we will uh, soon see. Greatorson played here the move king g7. It looks like a nice way to stabilize the situation on the king side, but in hindsight, moving the knight away from f6 to d7 is the move which should have been played, but it's not obvious why that's such an important move. Let's have a look at the game's continuation. Pause the video here for a second and try to figure out what is the best move here for white. And if you can play in the same way as world's number one, Magnus Carlsen, he comes up with a creative idea. If you see it for the first time, it's brilliant. But for Magnus, this idea is very well known. He goes for the move knight to h4. That's a shocking idea because you place the knight at the edge of the board. It can simply be taken by the pawn on g5. But if you take that pawn, there is bishop takes h4. And now we see that the pin is back on the board. The knight cannot move away because then the queen is hanging. And whatever you do on the next move, white is going to capture the, with the bishop on f6. And together with the rook, you regain the piece or you even win the queen for some material. So that is... Just a very important tactical idea. Let's go back one second, because after this move, knight h4, it's not just you're putting the knight there and the, the knight cannot be taken. No, there's this deadly knight fork, knight f5, attacking both the king and the queen. Very, very strong positional chess, making use of a nice tactical idea. Now, just I go quickly back to that uh, aforementioned game of Carlsen against Tabata by, because... In that game, we had this position on the board. We're not going to cover the entire game, but Magnus Carlsen played at this point also the move knight to h4 with the idea that if you take it, there is bishop takes h4 and it's the very same tactical idea. So Magnus uses the same tactical idea for the second time in his, uh, in his career, even in this year. So after the move knight h4, back to the current game of... Um, uh, Carlson against Greatorson, Black cannot take the knight, has to do something about that weak square on f5. Played here to move bishop to g6. The knight comes in to f5 anyway. And now after bishop takes, rook takes, Black has managed to avoid an immediate disaster. But looking at this position, there are so many huge holes in Black's position, particularly the f5 square cannot be contested by a black pawn any longer. White has two bishops and the position is relatively open. There are various ideas of opening the, opening the position with a pawn break. That could be h4, it could be d4, it could be a4. And of course, there is also the plan of tripling down on the f file. That's what Magnus is going to do first. After the knight goes away, knight d7, queen e2. So the queen is looking in this direction, trying to infiltrate via these light squares, queen e8, rook af1, very good positional chess, threatening to take the pawn on f7 because it's three times attacked. And um, 
Therefore, the move f6 is played. So this is like a checkers formation. All these pawns, they look rock solid, like you cannot break uh, down this, um, this sort of fortress. But the difference is that white can also play along the light squares in, uh, in chess. So it's not such a powerful fortress. First, the pawn comes to h4, knight e7, attacking the rook on uh, f5. So the rook goes back. No need to calculate any crazy lines. Knight c5. Of course, black wants to get rid of that powerful bishop. But the bishop goes back to c2. Knight g6. Attacking the pawn. But now, pawn comes to h5. Attacking the knight. Please go back with your knight. And now the move d4. White is opening the center. And of course, if you do take the pawn, white recaptures with the e pawn. Now the mobile pawn formation is back again. These bishops are monsters. You're attacking the knight. If the knight goes away... I will play e5 with my eyes closed and I'm just going to crush your king in less than 10 moves. That's what's going to happen then. So the knight goes back to d7, protecting the knight uh, with the knight that pawn on uh, e5, trying to hold on to that um, uh, post in the, in the center. Bishop to b3. The bishop is now back because the knight has been driven back. Rook d8 and... Black cannot do anything. His position is very passive and white creates a new front on the queen side with ideas of challenging these pawns. So black is getting attacked from different angles. Now after something like c6 to protect the pawn, you can even consider entering with a bishop. I don't know where the bishop is going next, but you can easily switch from one side to another. The position is really, really bad. So that's something Gatorson didn't want to see happening. He felt, okay, I need to do something now. He played a move f5. That's a radical move. He doesn't want to sit, but sit and wait. But the idea is that if you take on f5, then black is able to lock the position with the move e4. Next, the knight will come to f6. And despite being a pawn down, the position remains closed and white pieces are unable to get closer to the black king. So therefore, first take the pawn on e5. Now after knight takes e5, now the pawn on f5 uh, was taken. You're threatening f6 with a double attack. And black's idea was now to set up a blockade with the king. So the white pawn on f5 is not able to come forward. The pawn has been blockaded by the king. And if queens would come off the board and more pieces would be exchanged, this could be quite a reliable way to um, set up a blockade. But bishop comes into e6 just to protect the pawn. Queen c6, pawn takes... Pawn, queen takes pawn, offering the exchange of queens, but white is not interested. White wants to keep the queens on the board. And one day, if you're able to open up the position, this king is in deep trouble. Black played the move a5, and now Magnus shows his class because he realizes it's difficult to break through on the king side, but he goes for the move b3 with the idea that after rook b8, well, the pawn is still nicely defended by both the bishop and the queen, the rook comes to the a file so white is shifting the attention to a new weakness which can be targeted multiple times by both rooks by the queen maybe the bishop can even help to uh, attack that pawn knight to c6 was played and pawn comes to e4 white is improving his position every move queen c5 check it's even a double attack on uh, the king and the pawn but bishop f2 taking the queen black captures the pawn now it's rook c2, putting pressure on the queen. If the queen goes away to b4, now the bishop comes back to d5. If the knight goes away, this pawn on c7 is in trouble. One important line is that if you protect the knight with your queen one more time, there's bishop takes c6, knight takes c6, and queen c1. And the knight can no longer be defended by another piece. Rook b6 is not possible because of bishop takes b6. So that means... The knight has to move away, and then the pawn on c7 can be taken. Well, in the game, black moved the knight to e7 right away instead of playing queen b5. But rook takes c7 is there. Rook fc8, trying to exchange pieces. But now another great move by Magnus. Do you want to exchange that active rook for one passive rook of black? No way. You keep the rook on the seventh rank. Keep an eye on that pawn on a5 as well as you try to retain control over the seventh rank. Now, 
You cannot take on d5. After queen takes d5, there are a lot of mating threats and black's position is falling apart. So black instead went for the move rook c3, but what is black exactly doing? Well, bishop c4 was, uh, was played. That's a nice idea to open up the file for the queen, but also the bishop can quickly come to uh, d4 very, very soon. Rook b6, what's this? You're hanging your rook. Well, if you take that rook, Queen takes b6 with check and the rook on a7 is hanging as well. So don't get tempted to take that rook. Bishop d4 is a much better idea. You're attacking the rook on c3 and the rook is actually kind of trapped. I mean, you, you may go to, to g3, but you can even attack the rook one more time. So the rook is not able to go anywhere. Rook takes c4 was played. B takes c4 and now... Knight to c6. So the idea is that you want to get rid of this bishop and maybe try to escape into some sort of endgame. Maybe you can exchange queens next after that. Well, not clear if that's possible. Anyway, this all didn't happen. Rook h7 on the board. And you're threatening to take on h6. Another pawn. You're an exchange up. Eventually you get access to the black king. So here Greater Son had seen enough. Fantastic game, Magnus used a tactic he used earlier this year. So it's remarkable that in very similar structure against Tabata Bay in this position, he used this move knight h4. Against Greaterson, he also used the move knight h4, both on move 19. How curious is that? Well, I hope you learned something from this game. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe to the channel and more coverage of this tournament in the coming days.